All right, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew 6, the Bibles in front of you are available for your use. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament. It's about two-thirds of the way through your Bibles. This morning is the sixth sermon in our seven-part series entitled The Lord's Prayer. As we are walking slowly but surely through this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And one of the crucial things that we have been stressing from the outset of this series is that Jesus, in this section of Matthew, assumes that his disciples pray. He assumes that prayer is part of our lives. And the reason that that is such a basic assumption is that prayer is our part of the ongoing communication that exists between God and us. For any healthy relationship that exists in our life, regular communication is an essential component. And what's amazing about the God of the scriptures is that our God is a speaking God. We see that from the very opening words of the book of Genesis. When we read in Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light. And then over and over again, God speaks as he forms and he fills his earth by the power of his word. When the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, took on flesh and blood and came into this world, the gospel writer John calls Jesus the Word. John 1.14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He did that among many other reasons because Jesus communicates and reveals who God is before our very eyes. God creates by the power of his spoken word. Jesus, as the word, reveals and communicates God to us. And the scriptures, the Holy Bible, is the very word of God. So that now, through God's word, we can listen to God speak to us whenever we desire. Second Peter 1.21 says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The scriptures are God's inspired words to us, and therefore we know that whatever scripture says, God says. We don't have to wonder why God created this world, or what God's desire is for our lives, or even how we are to pray. God has spoken, and he continues to speak to us every time we read his word. We do not need to listen for some audible whisper, or look for signs and wonders, or listen to those who claim to be modern day prophets, for we have the very word of God that sufficiently reveals everything God wants us to know about himself, about our lives, and about his world every time we read from its pages. But God has not set up a one-way communication plan. God has called us into a relationship with himself and therefore has given to us this amazing gift that we call prayer so we can speak back to God. God speaks to us through his word. We speak back to God through prayer because we are in a relationship with our creator. And now that we are six weeks into this series, my hope and prayer for us is that we are building prayer more and more into our lives. We can talk about prayer all we want, but if we aren't using it, if we aren't finding ourselves praying more and using these things so that we understand prayer in order to converse with our God, then we're missing the whole point. There's one more week in this series after today, and then we'll be moving into Advent. But as we do, my prayer for us is that our prayer life with God becomes as natural and as regular to us as the conversations that we have with others we are in relationship with, because this is what disciples of Jesus do. Disciples of Jesus who are in relationship with God, we speak with God through prayer. And so now as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God, for what scripture says, God says. Wherever you're at this morning, if you're able, I want to invite you to rise with me as we stand in attention to the voice of our God from his word. Matthew 6, we'll read verses 5 to 15. And when we get to the Lord's prayer in verse 9, I would invite you to say that out loud with me. Here's verse 5. But when you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. When you pray, 
Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And this is God's holy and sufficient word for us today. Let's pray together. Father, your word is truth. So sanctify us, change us, mold us, and shape us by the truth of your word today. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake, and together we say, amen. Please be seated. Debt can be completely crippling and debilitating to an individual or a family's financial future, whether that's credit card debt or the six-figure debt that often accompanies a college degree these days, or a mortgage that's three to five times your annual income, or our country's national debt that now sits in excess of $31 trillion dollars, When you owe someone something, when you are indebted to someone, that is like a heavy weight that sits down upon you that you take with you wherever you go and whatever you do. Now, in the ancient world, debt was punishable by prison sentence. In the Roman Empire, their prisons were mostly populated by those who could not pay back their debts. There was no bankruptcy court to run to and to seek shelter in. And so you were put into prison with the expectation that your family would then work to pay off your debt in order for you to be released. And so when you put yourself into debt in the Roman Empire, there was, it was often accompanied by great pain and tragedy, not only for the individual, but also for their family. In Jesus' day in first century Palestine, debt was often a matter of life and death. And it's into that context that Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. He uses that word debt because it's meant to invoke serious offense that is accompanied by serious consequences. And even though in our day, debt has been normalized for us, in that day, you did everything you could to avoid being in debt because there was no hope of a government bailout or another stimulus check. Now, let's remember that in this section of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is seeking to completely reorient the lives and hearts of his disciples. And he does that here by teaching us how and what to pray. Because what our prayers often uh, reveal is that we think of God as existing in a magic lamp, waiting to be rubbed to come out and grant us our three wishes. Because if we only come to God when we're in need and we only ask him to fix that which is broken, that reveals what we think about God and what we think the purpose of prayer is, to just keep our lives moving in the direction we want them to go. And so Jesus comes and he seeks to reorient the hearts of his disciples so that we understand that we exist for God's glory rather than God existing for ours. The very first thing that we are called to pray for is that God's name, 
the entirety of who God is would be glorified and hallowed on the earth. And that happens as God's kingdom comes to earth more fully, as more and more people enter into that kingdom as its citizens by faith and trust in Jesus Christ and the gospel, and then seek to live out God's will, God's commands in our lives. That, Jesus says, is to be the primary concern of ours as we come to him in prayer. And it should shape how we view and walk through life. And then Jesus gives us three more petitions. There's six petitions in all in this prayer. The first three deal with God's glory, God's kingdom, and God's will. And the second three reveal what we need in order to pursue God's glory, God's kingdom, and God's will. And so last week, Pastor Mike walked us through the first of those final three petitions. Give us this day our daily bread. And Jesus reveals that the earthy things, the fleshy things of life, they matter. We need food. We need clothing. We need shelter. We need good health. We need the physical things of life so that we can live, so that we can pursue God's will of desire, so that we can live in obedience to God's design, so that his kingdom comes, so that God's name is glorified on the earth. The physical necessities of life, they matter, not as an end unto themselves, but so that God's name would be glorified through us. And today, Jesus shows us that our sin against God puts us into spiritual debt, which is crippling and debilitating, not to our financial future, but to our spiritual future, as it inhibits our desire and our ability to live for God's kingdom and God's glory. And so what we want to see in our text this morning is that because sin disrupts and damages all of our relationships— we must ensure that we are a forgiven and a forgiving people. And we'll develop that this morning by seeing first our deepest spiritual need. Second, we'll see our motivation to forgive others. And then third, we'll see the purpose of forgiveness. And so first, let's see our deepest spiritual need. We need daily bread so that we can live and not die physically. And we need daily forgiveness so that we can live and not die spiritually. These two petitions, they go hand in hand because God has created us to be embodied souls, spiritual and physical. And while many people throughout history have made one or the other of those two things to be a negative thing, usually throughout history, the physical was seen as detrimental to the higher spiritual, though it might be reversed today. Jesus reveals in this prayer that both matter, the physical and the spiritual. And so we ought to prolong life on this earth as long as we are able so that both our souls and our bodies can live and promote the glory of God on the earth. And just like our bodies need to be continually fed so they remain healthy for us to live for that purpose, so our souls need to be continually forgiven so that they remain healthy as well. Now, someone might ask, If God has already forgiven me when I repented of my sin and I put my faith in Jesus and the gospel, why do I need to continue to ask him for forgiveness? And that's a critically important question that we have to answer because we can easily slip into the trap of thinking that we move in and out of grace, we move in and out of God's love, we move in and out even of salvation based upon whether or not we have asked for for God's forgiveness. I remember thinking that way as a young child and wondering if I was to suddenly get in a car accident and die before I asked for my most recent sin's forgiveness, would I still be saved? But let's remember who Jesus is teaching this prayer to. He's teaching this prayer to his disciples to those who have already become citizens of God's kingdom through faith in its king. This is a family prayer, remember? Jesus has instructed us to call the holy, infinite, and almighty God our Father. Which means that this prayer for forgiveness is being made by those who have already been justified by faith in the gospel. 
To be justified, to be declared not guilty by God is both to have your sin forgiven and removed because of what Jesus did by dying on the cross for us in our place and to have the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ which he has earned through his perfect and sinless life in full obedience to God's will of desire, God's commandments and laws, to have that righteousness credited to and counted as our own so that now when God looks upon us, he sees us as being fully in Jesus, fully justified and adopted into God's family as his very own children. So 1 John 3, 1 tells us this. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. When we repent of our sin and trust in Jesus, we are in that moment justified and adopted into God's family. And now as children of God, we pray to our Father, forgive us our debts. So we're not asking God to save us over and over again. You are justified once. And when that has truly happened, that is not something that you can ever lose. For Jesus tells us in John 6, all those the Father has given me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. So we're not praying to God in this prayer as a judge, though God is certainly the judge of all the earth. But as adopted children, we are praying this prayer to God as our Father. So back to the question, if God has already forgiven me of my sin, why do I need to continue to ask for forgiveness? Well, the answer is twofold. First, because we continue to daily sin to daily break his commands, to daily walk outside of God's will. We are continually debtors in that sense of the word. But second, because sin disrupts. And if not dealt with, sin causes great damage to our relationships. God as our father is displeased by our sin because it often reveals that at some level, We are still believing that there is greater joy and greater satisfaction in walking in disobedience to his commands rather than in obedience to them. Now, when our children mess up and blow it, we don't want them to think that they're at risk of being kicked out of the family. And neither does our father in heaven. But we also don't want our children to think that disobedience is no big deal. Children are meant to feel secure but they're also meant to be shaped. And so just like when our children disobey and do what ought not to be done, and that causes stress and strain in our relationship with them, so does our sin against God. Our sin displeases God, and we have disrupted the family relationship. And so Jesus invites us to daily bring our sin before God's throne, to seek his forgiveness for as beloved children, God is quick and eager to forgive us of that sin. Sin is a big deal because God's holiness is a big deal. We ought not think it's no big deal, try to sweep it under the rug or think that because we're saved, we can live however, do whatever we want. But we also need not cower in a corner with our head to the ground. For our Father is quick to forgive and quick to restore us again. Our deepest spiritual need is to be forgiven of our sin and justified and to be continually forgiven so that sin does not disrupt or damage our relationship with our Father. Second this morning, let's see our motivation to forgive others. The second part of this verse, if we really think about what it's saying, will cause us to take a deep gulp. Verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. We're asking God essentially to treat us like we treat others. Forgive us as we have forgiven others. Wow. The only people that can pray like that 
are those who have been brought into the family of God, who have been brought into Jesus' church and been made part of the new covenant which Jesus has established through his blood poured out on the cross. Let me explain what I mean by that. See, the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament spoke about a new covenant which God was going to establish with his people. And he describes it this way in Jeremiah 31. He says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts, no longer on tablets of stone. And I will be their God and they shall be my people for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. See, God spoke of a time when he would establish the final piece of the covenant of grace that has been building and developing since the days of Abraham in Genesis 12. He calls this final piece the new covenant. And by it, God would fulfill that great Emmanuel promise that we see throughout the Old Testament where God would be with us, even in us by his spirit as our God. We would be with him as his people, but this would happen only once our sin would be paid for, forgiven, removed, and remembered no more. And so when Jesus establishes the sacrament of communion for his church, He declares that this new covenant was now being set into place as he poured that wine into the cup, symbolizing his own blood being poured out on the cross so that our debt would be paid and our sin would be paid for, forgiven, removed, and remembered no more. At the Passover meal in Luke 22, Jesus says this, this cup, that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And see what disciples of Jesus know in love is that while we are worthy and deserving of God's judgment and wrath, Jesus Christ went to a cross and he died suffering the most brutal of deaths so that our debt would be paid and our sin against God forgiven and removed and remembered no more. And as new covenant people who understand that Jesus Christ paid it all for us, we ask ourselves, how can we not forgive others? If God has forgiven me and continues to forgive me when I sin against him in all of his glory and honor and majesty, how can I not forgive others when they have sinned against me? And the answer is, we can't. We can't. Forgiven people forgive people. If we are those who tend to hold back forgiveness against others, we ought to wonder whether we have truly received God's forgiveness ourselves. Because Jesus makes it clear that an unforgiving person is an unforgiven person. But the one who knows that their sin has been forgiven by the grace and mercy of God through the work of Jesus Christ, will in turn be eager to forgive others when they sin against them. And if we aren't, it's possible, even likely, that we have not received that forgiveness ourselves. There's a parable that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 18 about an unforgiving servant And this servant had racked up a debt of 20 years worth of wages. That's an unpayable debt. And so from his prison cell, remember that's where debtors went in that day, from his prison cell, he begs and pleads for his master to forgive him of his debt. And the master does it, completely wipes away that unpayable debt. And so upon being released from that cell, this servant goes to a fellow servant who owed him not 20 years wages, but a single day's wage. 
And so he demands payment. And when that fellow servant is unable to pay, he has that fellow servant thrown into prison. And Jesus tells us that parable because it's impossible to read it and not get angry and not ask ourselves, how could he do such a thing? But he tells it because it's a mirror for us to look into and to see what it's like when when we beg and plead God to forgive us of our sin against him, which is infinitely greater than the sins that others commit against us, as terrible as they are at times. And God, by his grace, does it. He forgives us of that sin. And then we turn and are unwilling to forgive others when they sin against us. J.I. Packer in his book on the Lord's Prayer says this. He says, one whose only hope is that God will not hold his faults against him forfeits his rights to hold others' faults against them. Now let's acknowledge this can be extremely difficult. Forgiveness hurts because the sin that others have committed against us hurts and is painful and causes scars that do not quickly heal or may not ever fully subside. But we must constantly remember the great price that Jesus paid as he hung on that cross, as he endured his father's wrath so that our sin against him could be paid for and forgiven. And when we forgive others, it doesn't mean that they don't experience the consequences of their sin in this life. When Jesus forgave the man hanging on the cross next to him, that man still died. He still paid the penalty for justice. And it doesn't mean we cannot be wise and seek to establish boundaries and separation so that future sin against us isn't committed, but it does mean that we are called to forgive as we hope to be continually forgiven by our God. Releasing others from the sin committed against us. It is to say, you are no longer in my debt. You owe me nothing. I will not hold anything over your head because forgiven people forgive people. Finally, this morning, let's see the purpose of seeking our forgiveness. Each of these six petitions, as we have said, are like links in a chain that all connect and depend upon each other. Because the Christian life, the life of discipleship, is one that seeks to live in obedience to Jesus as our King to serve him, to submit ourselves fully to his will, to his commands, all of which is an act of faith and trust. And as we do that, God's kingdom comes more fully to the earth, just like it is in heaven. When we live as sacrificial servants in our homes, our marriages, and in our friendships, as we work with honesty and integrity in our jobs and in our careers, as we seek biblical justice in our culture and in our laws, as we seek to educate our children about God's creation and how life is to be lived within it, as we seek to share the gospel with those who do not yet know Jesus as Savior and Lord in all these ways and so many more, we live out God's will for our lives so that God's kingdom comes as God is glorified throughout his globe. And yet the reality is that for the rest of our days on this earth, Because of our sin nature, we will at times not live as sacrificial servants in our homes, marriages, and relationships. We won't always put in an honest day's work at our jobs. We will ignore the injustice that exists in our laws and in our land. And at times, we will hold back from sharing the gospel because of the potential relational cost. At times, our sin takes us off the path of living for the ultimate glory of the Lord's prayer. And so to both keep us on the path or to redirect us back into the path of living this kind of life with that kind of vision, we need first to have our physical needs met, which Jesus promises to do in Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you, meaning All the physical necessities of life, God will provide for you. So keep coming to him, keep depending upon him. And 
We need continual communion with God so that we continue to grow in our love for him and live on mission for him. And unconfessed sin, unforgiven sin is a great enemy of that communion. And so Jesus tells us, come daily before God in prayer, confessing your sin, that which you have done that goes against his commands, that which we have left undone, which his commands call us to do. Give us this day both our daily bread and the forgiveness of our debt so that physically and spiritually our lives will be lived for you. Yes, the sin of our life is displeasing to our Father. But as beloved children, our perfect Father is quick to forgive us, quick to wrap us in his arms, and quick to assure us that we will never lose our status as his children. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know God like that, if you don't know God like a loving, heavenly Father, Jesus is calling you today to come to him, to confess your sin before God, to repent of that sin, meaning to turn from it and to turn to Jesus because he has done everything necessary for us to be saved. He lived a sinless life you could not live. He died the death on the cross that we deserve to die and he rose victorious from the grave so that we could have new life with God now and for all eternity. Friends, don't leave here today without talking to somebody about what it means to know God as a father. Jesus teaches his people to pray this prayer and to say, may my sin be forgiven so that our relationship is healed. Let nothing pull me away of pursuing the path and living the life where your will is done so that your kingdom comes, so that your name is glorified on the earth. That is a radical prayer that only new covenant people can pray. And so let's make that part of our lives individually and our lives as a church so that God's name is glorified in and through us. Let's pray. Father, our sin is great, but your grace is greater. Jesus, we praise you for going to the cross in order to pay our debt through your shed blood. May we daily run to your throne and confess our sins so that nothing hinders us from living for your glory. And Father, may we be quick to forgive others so that we put the gospel on display for the world to see. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Let's rest in the truth that Jesus paid it all so we can be a people marked by forgiveness.